Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harriton. Right now I'm hanging out in western Pennsylvania with one of my favorite trees, eastern hemlock. Today I want to discuss something incredible that isn't too familiar to many people outside of academic settings. If you are unfamiliar with what we're about to discuss, I encourage you to really pay attention because the information in this video can help you better understand what's currently happening to many of our forests. So if you know a few things about the eastern hemlock, you might know that it is the state tree of Pennsylvania. You might know that eastern hemlock is a long-lived, late successional, shade-tolerant tree. You might know that an insect known as the hemlock woolly adelgid has been threatening the health of eastern hemlock for decades. Now, hemlock woolly adelgid infestation is worrying a lot of people for good reason. Eastern hemlock is what many ecologists refer to as a foundation species. And a foundation species is one that essentially defines its ecosystem. Any major threat to a forested foundation species like eastern hemlock can significantly alter forest structure and function. But here's something important to keep in mind. Threats to eastern hemlock aren't anything new. And when we understand what has happened to eastern hemlock in the past, we might be able to make better sense of what's happening to eastern hemlock right now. As it turns out, something on a very grand scale affected eastern hemlock roughly 5,000 to 5,500 years ago, leading to a drastic decline in hemlock population numbers that lasted for nearly 2,000 years. This phenomenon wasn't just a local occurrence, it was a range-wide collapse. What we're talking about is actually one of the most thoroughly studied and written about ecological events of the Holocene. The Holocene is just a fancy name given to the last 11,700 years of Earth's history. Eastern hemlock, during the time leading up to the mid-Holocene, was a dominant tree in many eastern North American forests. Within a few centuries, however, and at some sites within a decade, hemlock numbers dropped precipitously and remained incredibly low for nearly two millennia. This catastrophic decline was first scientifically recognized in 1939 by an ecologist named Edward D.B. Jr., who looked at pollen samples in lakes and bogs in Connecticut and concluded that a significant decrease in hemlock abundance occurred during the mid-Holocene. Now, you might be wondering, how does pollen help us interpret events of the past? Well, it's important to understand that the pollen of many plants can be microscopically identified to genus and often to species. When pollen makes its way into bodies of water, like lakes and bogs, the rigid outer cell walls of the pollen grains allow the pollen to be preserved in sediment layers at the bottoms of these bodies of water. Researchers who want to study past biological events can then take samples of the sediment layers and determine which plants were living at the time the sediment was deposited and also infer what the climate might have been like at the time the sediment was deposited. So through pollen analysis, it was discovered that, in Connecticut, eastern hemlock decreased in abundance during the mid-Holocene. Other areas in the Northeast eventually turned up similar findings, and this map, which was published in 2012, shows some of the locations where the mid-Holocene hemlock decline has been detected. Now, in 1981, an ecologist named Margaret Davis wrote a particularly influential paper suggesting that hemlock numbers dropped everywhere across the entire range of the species roughly at the same time during the mid-Holocene. Meaning, when hemlock numbers were dropping in New Hampshire, they were also dropping simultaneously in New York and in New Brunswick. Now I want to pause right here for just a second and ask you, why do you think this happened? Why do you think hemlock numbers dropped apparently simultaneously across the entire range of the species? What could have caused such a drastic change to the landscape? Well, when we look at the research of Margaret Davis, we see what kinds of culprits she considered. She considered climate. She considered fire. She considered wind storms. She considered human influences unrelated to fire. Those are four considerations right there. But the fifth consideration was the one she thought was most likely to be responsible for the range-wide collapse of eastern hemlock during the mid-Holocene, pathogen or pest outbreak. 
According to Margaret Davis, a sudden outbreak of hemlock loopers or similar pests caused the hemlock decline. And hemlock loopers are moths whose larvae feed on eastern hemlock foliage. Now the pathogen or pest outbreak hypothesis was widely accepted for years. And considering this idea based on what's happening today in our forests, it seems to make a lot of sense. The mid-Holocene collapse of eastern hemlock was species specific. It covered the entire range of the species. It seemingly happened at the same time across the entire range of the species. And it happened rather quickly. All of these factors point to a forest pathogen or pest of some sort. And all we have to do is look at what has happened in more recent years to American chestnut with chestnut blight, or to American elm with Dutch elm disease, or to ash trees with emerald ash borer, to witness devastating effects caused by some kind of pathogen or pest, whether it's a fungus or an insect or even bacteria or something else. Eventually, however, people started to question this hypothesis and they began to turn their attention toward one of Margaret Davis's other culprits, changing climate. During the mid-Holocene, so roughly 4,500 to 6,000 years ago, the climate in eastern North America experienced significant changes. More specifically, the climate changed from being relatively wet to relatively dry. As it turns out, eastern hemlock is a drought intolerant species that doesn't do very well in persistently dry conditions. Eastern hemlock has relatively high moisture requirements, and it typically grows in areas that annually receive between 30 to 50 inches of precipitation. You often find eastern hemlock growing in cool, moist, shaded ravines, and also in and around the edges of shallow swamps. Now yes, you will find eastern hemlock growing in drier, rockier sites that receive less moisture, but if you asked eastern hemlock, hey, which conditions do you really prefer? Its answer would probably be moist conditions in regions with cool, humid climates. Well, 4,500 to 6,000 years ago, the climate changed rather significantly. Wet conditions became dry. Severe droughts occurred repeatedly. And eastern hemlock numbers dropped. Now, this isn't to say that insects or pathogens had nothing to do with the decline of eastern hemlock thousands of years ago. As conditions became drier, it is possible that stressed trees became more susceptible to attack and that shifts in climate worked in conjunction with pests and pathogens to eliminate eastern hemlock. But as it currently stands, many ecologists believe that the mid-Holocene hemlock collapse was strongly associated with an abrupt change in climate. Fortunately for eastern hemlock, repeated droughts didn't go on forever, and the climate in eastern North America changed again. It became cooler and moister between two to 3,000 years ago, and while eastern hemlock failed to recover at some high elevation sites, it did eventually recolonize much of its former range. Now, is this the end of the story? Well, not quite. It shouldn't surprise you to hear that some modern ecologists call into question certain parts of this narrative. A paper published in 2012 suggested that the mid-Holocene hemlock decline may not have happened quite so simultaneously across the entire range of the species, and that the factors that kept eastern hemlock populations low for 2,000 years following the initial collapse might not have been the same factors that caused the massive decline of eastern hemlock in the first place. An abrupt change in climate almost certainly kept hemlock numbers low from about 3,000 to 5,000 years ago. But an abrupt change in climate might not have been the main driver behind the initial decline. A mix of factors, all definitively unproven at this point, likely contributed to the initial decline. Additionally, other hemlock declines occurred prior to the great mid-Holocene collapse, with notable declines occurring six and 8,000 years ago. Now, we're obviously not spending much time in this video talking about the current plight of eastern hemlock and how the hemlock woolly adelgid is basically threatening the existence of this tree in North America. But it's hard not to relate the great hemlock decline of the mid-Holocene to what's happening today. All I'll say before concluding this video is that I hope what we've covered in this video broadens your perspective just a bit and helps you better understand the kinds of changes that we're seeing in our forests today. Of course, no one wants to see a range-wide collapse of eastern hemlock today. No one wants to see American chestnut remain in its current compromised state. 
No one wants to see the complete annihilation of butternut and elm and ash and any other species that humans deem desirable. And it is important, I believe, to implement reasonable measures to support the health and continued existence of these particular species, especially when we may be partly responsible for their current struggles. But I also see the importance of recognizing that change is inevitable, cycles dominate nature, life is resilient, and despite the human desire to want to control as much as we possibly can, there are so many things outside of our control. A lot can happen in a few years. A lot can happen in a few centuries. A lot can happen in a few thousand years. We often don't think in terms of centuries, millennia, or even greater time scales, but I don't think it's a bad thing to do so every once in a while. Thank you for watching this video. If you are interested in learning more about trees, tree identification, tree ecology, and natural history of trees, check out an online course that I created. It's called Trees in All Seasons, and it'll help you identify not only Eastern Hemlock, but over 100 other trees. To find that course, go to learnyourland.com and click on Trees in All Seasons to learn more. Thanks again for watching this video. I will see you on the next one.